Together, we're going to look at the probability distribution we're going to be using in the subsequent module. Here, the reference for this class is what we have in chapter four for the book of this class, Holistic Machine Learning for Civil Engineer. So here we're going to cover three main distributions. There are way more than this, but these are going to be the main one we're going to be using, namely the normal, the log normal, and the beta PDF. Here we're covering the second module related to probability theory, where we're going to look at probability distributions. So let's start with the normal distribution. Okay, this is one that is widely used in the field of machine learning. We're going to see what are its key properties. Okay, so typically we're going to refer to the normal random uh, variable as this calligraphic n parameterized by the expected value and standard deviation. Okay, we're going to first look at the univariate case, then the multivariate case. We're going to see what are the key properties that are going to, we're going to be interested in uh, when we're going to use it in our machine learning models. And we're going to look at some examples where we can use it for the conditional distribution and for the sum of normal random variable. Okay, so we've already covered some part of this in the module one where we review the concept of probability theory, but we're gonna dig here in a little more uh, deeper details. So we can say that a random variable X is distributed like a normal random variable, uh, which describes the probability density function for the possible outcomes X, and this PDF is parameterized by mu, the expected value, and sigma, its standard deviation, okay? So this is defined for the random variable x such that the lowercase x, the possible outcomes, belongs to the real space. And this here is the analytical formulation describing the PDF for my normal random variable x. If I want to obtain the CDF, it's going to be simply the integral of the formulation for my PDF I have here. And if I want to look at a simple example, here are the, the horizontal axis, I have the possible outcomes X. Vertical axis here on the leftmost figure is going to be the PDF, okay? The apex of that PDF is going to be the expected value plus and minus one standard deviation, okay? What I have here is going to be a CDF, so the integral of that PDF from minus infinity up to plus infinity, okay? No, sorry. The integral of the PDF from minus infinity up to the specific value x here. So it's going to be the area under the curve. For instance, the CDF value at x equals zero is going to be the integral from minus infinity up to the value here. Okay, now what we want to look at is how can we break down this formulation for this PDF, okay? So this is what we have here, same formulation as before. But what do we have on the top graph here is the innermost part of the normal PDF, which is here a linear function. So x minus mu divided by sigma. So in my case here, if mu equals zero, this is what I have here at, mu, at uh, x equals zero, I have zero. So x minus mu divided by sigma. And here my sigma plays the role of changing the slope of that linear function. The higher sigma, the less steep is my slope, the smaller is sigma, the higher is the slope, okay? So this is the most inner part here. Then what I have is this linear function is to the power two, okay? This is a quadratic function now. So this thing is strictly positive and at the expected value, the resulting quantity is zero, okay? And the value of the sigma here is gonna change how steep is my parabola. Okay, then what I have is that we multiply this by one half, but more importantly, the sign negative. Okay, so this was strictly positive. Now it becomes strictly negative. And if we take the exponential of something strictly negative, it's going to go from zero up to one. Okay, when we evaluate at zero, the exponential of zero is going to be uh, one and it's decreasing. Okay, it asymptotically decreased to zero. But this again looks my, like my bell curve, my normal PDF, but here this thing don't normalize to one, okay? The value at the expected value is gonna be one. However, if I take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, I'm gonna realize that this integral won't be one. And to be a valid PDF, the integral must be one. So here the integral of this thing is actually equal, equal to the square root of two pi times sigma. 
okay? So if I want to have a PDF that's going to normalize to 1, I need to divide by this quantity. And it means that what I have on the left of the exponential is actually my normalization constant, which is function here of sigma, my standard deviation. So in the end, my complete formulation is given here, where we see that, that the expected value, the uh, PDF value is not 1, but this was enforced by no, my normalization constant in order for it to for the integral to be equal to 1 over the whole domain. So let's look at a formulation for my bivariate normal PDF. Okay, this is the analytical formulation for my bivariate PDF. This part is what controls the value for x1, for x2. This controls the linear dependency between x1 and x2. And again, this is my normalization constant. So if we want to plot this on the graph, it would look like this. So what I have here is the joint PDF for x1, x2. Uh, this is represented as a surface. This is represented as a contour, like a topographic map. So in both cases, both means and contains the exact, means the same thing and contain the same exact knowledge. What do you see here in red? This is going to be the marginal PDF for x1. This is going to be the marginal PDF of x2. So if we want to look at this in a little more detail, this is how it looks like. So what you see here is my joint PDF, and this is my joint PDF, either as a surface or as a contour. And what you see here are the marginal for either x1 or the marginal of x2. And here, notice how the joint PDF doesn't have the same height as the marginal. Why is that? It's because the joint is required to integrate to 1 over that bidimensional domain, if we integrate over the bidimensional domain. Whereas that univariate for x1 is required to integrate to 1 if we integrate over x1. Over x2, it's required to integrate to 1 if we integrate on x2. And since x2 has less variability than x1, then it must have a higher probability density so that in both cases, the integral is equal to 1. Okay? So now what I want us to look at is what happens if we modify the values, for instance, for the standard deviation or the mean. So the sliders I have here, the first slider is the expected value or the mean of x1. So it's going to cause a translation. So if I increase x1, it's going to cause a translation to the right. If I decrease the expected value of x1, it creates a translation to the, the right. If I change x2, if I increase the expected value of x2, translation upwards, I reduce it, translation downwards. Okay. What happens if I change the value of x1? So if I decrease the value of x1, if I put it equal, my contour are going to be circular. And you see, as I change the standard deviation, it changed the height of my marginal PDF. Okay? So depending on the value I put here. So if I change x1, it changed the horizontal scale. If it changed x2, it's going to change the vertical scale. Now, what happens if I play with my correlation coefficient? We're going to see that we're going to increase the linear dependency with respect to the variable. Okay? Now, what it means, it means that the positive and large outcome for x1 are associated with the large probability for the outcome of x2. If instead the correlation would be negative, it would be the other thing, okay? High values of x1 are associated with a high probability for a low value of x2. In that case, the ridge goes in one direction or the other. And keep in mind that no matter what is my correlation, positive or negative, it won't change my marginal PDF, okay? It only changed my joint here. So here is for my uh, value for my joint PDF. Okay. Now let's look at the bivariate normal CDF, which is obtained by integrating from our x1 from minus 1 to infinity, x2 from minus, uh, from minus, no, x1 from minus infinity to x1, x2 from minus infinity to x2. Uh, here it should be x1, x2, not x and y. So here I have a representation of my joint CDF by a surface, representation as a contour, okay? And what you see here in bold red would, are going to be the marginal CDF for, in this case, x1, marginal CDF for x2. And let's look at the interactive example. Now I have my joint CDF. What happens if I modify x1? So if I increase x1, I see a translation of my CDF. 
I modify it x1. If I do for it x2, it's going to be my other dimension that's going to be modified, okay? If I change my standard deviation, it's going to change the slope of my CDF, increasing the standard deviation, increase the slope, decreasing the standard deviation, decrease the slope, okay? I can have a really sharp ridge or a more diffuse ridge, okay? This is the effect of each uh, parameter. And finally, if I change my, my correlation coefficient, it's going to make a ridge that is more or less sharp. So if I increase to close to one, my standard deviation, you see it makes a kind of sharp corner, okay? It's because just before, when we were looking at the uh, joint PDF, we saw that we really add a ridge to describe our joint probability, okay? So when we integrate for over that ridge, it gives a sharp corner here. The opposite, if we have a low correlation, it's going to have a really smooth uh, ridge here because the dependency is in the other direction. So here's for the uh, bivariate normal CDF. So if we want to look at the general case, not only bivariate, my multivariate normal PDF is described by here my random vector x as described by its mean vector and covariance matrix defined for my random vector containing an arbitrary number of random variable. Okay, this m of x is described by the mean vector and sigma x is going to be the covariance matrix. My covariance matrix uh, on the main diagonal, I have the variance for each of my random variable. My off diagonal terms are going to be uh, always the product of my correlation coefficient between a pair of random variable times the standard deviation for one variable times standard deviation for the other one. And this covariance matrix is symmetric. Okay, meaning that each term I have on the upper diagonal, I have the same on the lower diagonal. And these covariance matrix are always square. So the joint normal PDF for a uh, normal random variable uh, or a vector of normal random variable is going to be taking this form for the PDF. Okay, so whatever we have on the left of the exponential is going to be our normalization constant. So meaning that if we integrate everything that is uh, in the exponential, for all the dimension, we would get what's on the denominator here, where it's function of the determinant of the covariance matrix. Because the covariance matrix is what's going to scale my PDF, okay? So it's normal that my normalization constant is going to be function of the determinant of that covariance, okay? Because as we've seen in the introduction for a linear regression, the determinant measure the amount of change a linear transformation brings uh, in uh, change of space. So here inside our exponential, this is the quadratic form we have inside, and this is the covariance matrix with expand or contract or space. Okay, so if we look a little more closely at the covariance matrix, we can build it from the standard deviation matrix. This is a square matrix, which is zero everywhere except on the main diagonal where I have my standard deviation terms. We have the correlation matrix, which is one on the diagonal because a variable in itself is always linearly correlated. And we have on the off diagonal terms, my pairwise correlation coefficient. And if I do dx times rx times dx, so standard deviation times correlation times standard deviation matrix, I'm gonna obtain my covariance matrix. So there are key properties of the multivariate normal we're going to be interested in for the machine learning application. So first is that the multivariate uh, normal is completely defined by its mean vector and co covariance matrix. And we can also add, extract from the joint the marginal PDF, which are also normal. So if we have a multivariate normal, all the marginal are still normal. And we can extract the parameter of these univariate normal from the joint. Okay, so we can analytically uh, integrate over the multivariate uh, joint normal to marginalize and obtain the information about the marginal PDF. So for instance, if I have my i at random variable, I can simply define it as a normal with mean value or expected value, the i at value in my expected vector and the i at, I at line and i at column in my covariance matrix is gonna be the variance of that univariate PDF. For multivariate normal, in the case where we have a correlation coefficient equal to zero, it implies statistical independence between the pair xi and xj, okay? Keep in mind, this is not generally true, okay? In the general case, 
correlation coefficient equal to zero doesn't imply statistical independence because we can have nonlinear dependency. This is what we saw in the module 1b when we were revising probability theory. But in this case, with a special case of the multivariate normal, a correlation coefficient equal to zero imply statistical independence. We can say that the asymptotical distribution obtained from the sum of IID, so uh, independent identically distributed uh, random variable, uh, is normal. Okay, this is under the umbrella of the central uh, limit theorem. Okay, so here, for instance, if we have a set of n random variable, which are all statistically independent and identically distributed, the sum of these random variables on the, on the synthetic case where n tends to infinity is going to be distributed like a normal with a given mean value and variance. Other key properties is as we started to cover in module 1b, when we were again reviewing pro the core concept of probability theory, is that linear function of normal random variable are also normal. And one thing I forgot to mention, in terms of nomenclature, whether I refer to a normal random variable or a Gaussian random variable, both are going to be the same thing, okay? Whether I use in the context of this class Gaussian or normal, I'm talking exactly about the same thing. These are two synonyms. So we can say as well, a linear function of Gaussian random variable are also Gaussian, okay? So in the case, if we know the joint PDF for X, which is multivariate normal, and I have a deterministic function AX plus B, where X is a random vector, then it implies that Y is also a random vector. But here, in the case where we have linear function of normal random variable, this remains analytically tractable, okay? I know that Y is still going to be normal, okay? See, if X is normal and AX plus B is a linear function, Y is still going to be normally distributed where we have the expected value a mx plus b and covariance a sigma x times a transpose, okay? These relationships, if you want to demonstrate them, you have to use the change of variable rules we develop in the module 1b. We also have the relation that the conditional distributions are normal, okay? So if we have a, a big joint vector x, okay, which is multivariate normal, okay, we can further partition this vector into two subparts, x1 and x2. So if we want to subpart this vector, we also have to subpart my uh, mean vector and covariance matrix. So my mean vector is going to be mean for x1, mean vector for x2. Covariance matrix, covariance matrix for x1, covariance matrix for x2, and this is the cross covariance between x1 and x2. And sigma 1, 2 here is equal to the transpose of sigma 2, 1. So these two are symmetric, just the transpose of each other. So here is something we're particularly interested in. So we want to add the conditional PDF of x1, knowing that we've observed x2. So here it tells us that given that I'm going to observe the possible outcome for x2, how does it change my knowledge for the joint PDF of X1, okay? We've seen earlier that the division of a conditional is going to be a joint defined, divided by a marginal, okay? In this case, we can define analytically the joint and the marginal. And this, in the case of uh, jointly Gaussian or jointly normal random variable, this is going to maintain the normality, okay? And this gonna, we're going to have a closed form solution in order to evaluate that conditional expected vector and conditional covariance matrix, okay, which are going to be defined by these function, where the conditional mean vector is going to be the mean of my first vector plus the cross covariance times the inverse of the covariance for sigma 2. The value of x2 are my actual observation for my second vector of random variable minus the mean for m2. And for my uh, conditional covariance for x1, given I observe x2, is going to be sigma x1 minus my cross covariance sigma 1, 2 times the inverse of sigma 2 times the transpose of sigma 1, 2, so sigma 2, 1. And here, what you have to keep in mind is that the expected vector, the conditional expected vector depends on the observation. The covariance does not because x2 doesn't appear, appear in the formulation for the covariance. 
So if we want to simplify these equations for the special case where x1 is unidimensional and x2 is unidimensional, so only two variables in relation, I want to know how observing x2, which is univariate, change my knowledge for x1, which is also univariate. It's simplified to these two equations, where the posterior expected value for x1, given that I observe x2, is going to be the expected value of x1 plus rho, my correlation coefficient between x1 and x2 times standard deviation of x1 times my actual observed value for x2 minus its expected value divided by sigma 2. For my conditional standard deviation for x1 given x2, it's going to be equal to sigma 1, standard deviation for x1 times square root of 1 minus my correlation coefficient. So as before, the conditional expected value depends on the actual observation. My conditional standard deviation doesn't. So uh, here, an example of application of these conditional rule we just saw together. Okay, so we're going to apply this to characterize the resistance of two adjacent beam in a bridge. Okay, we have a bridge like this, which is made of several beams as illustrated here. Okay. And we assume that we have a prior knowledge for what could be the resistance of two beams that are side by side, okay? These two beams, the uh, prior knowledge for the resistance of the first one is that it follows a normal distribution with expected value 500 kilonewtons and standard deviation also 150 kilonewtons. And we have the same prior knowledge for the beam X2, okay? We know these two should have the same expected value, same variance, because these two were made by the same workers in the same factory with the same material pretty much at the same time, okay? So the, we have the same prior knowledge for both. And on top of this, we know that this knowledge is pretty uncertain, but if we're underestimating the resistance, okay, it's going to be the same for both beams. If we're overestimating the resistance, it's also going to be the same for both beams. So at the end, we represent that we have a strongly positive correlation between the resistance of both beams. So at the end, it means that if the resistance of one turned, on to, turned out to be high, it tells us that the resistance for the hotter beam should turn out to be high as well. So in that case, what we want to illustrate is how observing that the strength of the second beam is 500 kilonewton meters is going to change our prior knowledge for the strength of the first beam. Okay, this is where we want to use that Gaussian conditional. In that case, that Gaussian conditional, as we've seen before, it's still going to be Gaussian defined by the expected value and conditional expected value and conditional variance. In this case, if we use the formula we saw before, the new expected value is going to be 660 kilonewton meters with a standard deviation of 90, okay? So we started with the prior expected value of 500, but after observing that the second beam has a strength of 700 kilonewton meters, my new resistance is 660, okay? It modified my knowledge. Same thing for the uh, standard deviation, it was my prior 150. After observing that the second beam is 700, it reduces to 90, okay? If we look in more detail how we do this, we can represent from everything I've described in the previous slide, my joint prior knowledge for both X1 and X2, okay? I can build my mean vector, it was 500, 500, and I can build my covariance matrix. On the main diagonal is the variance of each beam, 150 square, 150 square. And my odd diagonal is gonna be this correlation coefficient, we define it as 0.8, time the respective variance, 150 and 150, so 150 square. So if I divide my joint defined by these things by my marginal for x2, I'm going to obtain the formulation for my conditional normal, okay? Of what is my knowledge of x1 given that I've observed x2, where my mean vector and covariance are going to be defined by these relations. If I replace by all the quantity I have here, so the expected value for uh, the resistance of the beam 1 times correlation coefficient times the variance of the beam x1, times uh, the observation for the um, the observation for the observation for um, the strength of the second beam minus 
500, in this case, is going to be the expected value for the second beam divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, the resulting expected value is going to be 660 kilonewton meters. The variance, we apply the same thing, 90. Okay. If we look at what's happening visually, what we have on the left graph here is my joint PDF for X1 and X2. On the right, I have my conditional PDF. So if we go visualize this, it looks like this. So here I have my joint PDF. This is X1 and this is X2. And what you see here are the scaled marginal, okay? I scaled them the height just for, to allow for a better visualization, okay? But what you see here is this was my joint prior knowledge as described by my mean vector and covariance matrix. And I observed here, or, I, I, or they tell me that I observed, that the strength of my second beam is 700 kilonewton meter. So this is equivalent to taking a slice into my joint PDF, okay? But as we have saw before, this joint PDF is going to integrate to 1 if I integrate with respect to all the values of x1, all the values of x2, okay? But now if I take a slice in that joint PDF, that slice is not going to integrate to 1 anymore. So then if I want this slice to be a proper PDF, I need to normalize. And how, how, do, how do I normalize? I take my joint and what we saw, we divide by the marginal probability of my observation. So in that case, the marginal probability density is going to be the height of my marginal PDF for x2 equal 700, okay? This was my joint PDF for x1, x2. This is my slice. This is not yet a proper PDF. If I want a proper PDF, this is what I'm going to have here, okay? So by dividing that joint, divided by the height of the marginal for all possible values of x2, we obtain this figure, which represents what is going to be my conditional PDF of x1 given a value of x2. And here you see that the expected value is going to be modified according to what is my actual observation of x2, but the variance is not, meaning that I have a perfect ridge which has the same width no matter what is going to be the actual observation of x2. And if we make this transparent, So here you can see what do we obtain here by this specific slide in my conditional PDF is that this PDF here is going to describe what is my posterior knowledge for the strength of X1 given that I observe X2 equal 700 kilonewton meters. Okay, this is how we can infer some quantity from other one that are observed. And this is going to be key later on when we're going to build our machine learning model. Then uh, when we have the sum of normal random variable, how can we use this in practice? Okay, we said, we said that if we have the linear function of random variable, this is going to maintain the linearity of the output, or no, the normality of the output. So the sum of random variable, this is intrinsically linear, so we can use this to say that the sum of normal random variable, the output is still going to be normal. So given two random variables, x and y, okay, uh, where both are normal, if x and y are statistically independent, we can say that z equals e, uh, x plus y. This is, uh, the PDF for z is going to be normal, where the expected value is going to be mu x plus mu y. The variance of z is going to be sigma x squared, so the variance of x plus the variance of y. In the case where the correlation coefficient is not equal to zero, in that case, z is still normal. The expected value is still the same, mu x plus mu y. But now the variance is going to be the variance of x plus the variance of y plus twice the correlation coefficients times sigma x times sigma y. If we want to generalize this, if I have z, which is the sum of uh, n random variable. In that case, it's still going to be z is still going to be normal. The expected value is going to be the sum of the expected value for each xi, and the variance for z is going to be actually uh, obtained by taking the sum of all the terms in the covariance matrix of x. 
okay? So I take all the values in the covariance matrix of, Z, of X, I sum them all, and that's gonna give me the variance of Z. So here, the covariance of X, I, X, J are all the I, J terms in my covariance matrix sigma. So let's apply this to an engineering example, okay? So here we have an example that, that implies the sum of uh, the normal random variable, where imagine we have a cable here, where that cable is made of 50 steel wires, okay? The whole thing is a cable, each dot you see here is one wire. And we assume that these wires have a ductile tile failure, so that whenever they reach their elastic limit, they're going to plastify at constant strength. So here, we assume that each of those wire have, and uh, we have a prior knowledge for the resistance of these wire, uh, described by a normal distribution, for which the expected value is 10, and the standard deviation is uh, 3 kilonewton. Okay, the question is, is, given our prior knowledge for each wire, what is our prior knowledge for the strength of the whole cable? Okay, so to do this, we have to sum the uh, resistance for each wires. Okay, so the sum from i equal 1 to 50 of all the xi, the uh, random variable that describe the strength of each cable. So if we take a first hypothesis, that each pair x i x j for i different than j uh, are statistically independent. Okay, in that case, the uh, my knowledge for the strength of cable is going to be described by a normal with expected value fifty times ten. So fifty times uh, the number of steel wires times the expected value of each wire. The variance here is going to be 50 times 3 squared, okay? So in that case, my covariance matrix is going to be diagonal because if I have independence between all pairs and variable, my covariant, my correlation coefficient is zero for all terms except the diagonal. It means that my covariance is also going to be diagonal, okay? So in that case, summing all the terms in my covariance matrix represents summing 50 terms, each equal to 3 squared. Okay, so the result, my standard deviation for that entire cable is going to be 21 kilonewton. If we take the other end of the spectrum in terms of hypothesis, we assume that the correlation coefficient between each pair of uh, wire is 1. In that case, my covariance matrix is full, so I don't have only terminal diagonal, I have a full matrix. Okay, so I have a matrix of size 50 by 50 where each term is equal to 3 squared. So in that case, I'm going to have 50 terms to the power 2, the number of terms in my covariance matrix, which are each equal to 3 to the power 2. So my standard deviation is now equal to 150. So if we represent this graphically, under the hypothesis that my uh, wires, the resistance, are independent of each other, my correlation coefficient is, and my correlation coefficient is 0, this is the distribution for my prior knowledge for what's the strength of the cable. If we have the case in blue where the correlation coefficient is 1, they're all linearly correlated, my variance is much greater. Okay, why is that? It's in because if we have the case where it's perfectly correlated, if any of the cable, the strength turn out to be high, it means that all my wires are have a high resistance. On the other hand, if any of those cables has a low resistance, they're all going to have a low resistance, okay? So there is a great variability in the possible strength of the cable. On the other hand, if they're all independent, some of them are going to be above average, some of them are going to be below average. But when you average all of them together, it greatly reduces the variability of the whole cable, okay? So here at the end, it shows, it illustrated the impact of the correlation I can have on the random variable and especially of the linear function of random variable. Okay, so we've seen what we needed to see for the normal or the Gaussian random variable. Now we're going to look at the log normal, okay? The univariate case, multivariate case, and we're going to see we have, it shares many of the properties we've seen for the normal random variable. So we're saying that the 
random variable x is going to be log normal if the log of that same random variable is normal, okay? So the univariate log normal PF is defined using its mean value and variance, okay? But these mean value and variance, the specificity is that it's defined in the log normal space, okay? So the typical normal PF was defined by mu and sigma, the parameter, okay? In this case, the parameters are going to be defined in the log space. This is why you have another nomenclature. Typically, we refer to these expected value in the log space as lambda and zeta square. Okay, zeta is the standard deviation of the log space or zeta squared, a variance in the log space. So we can either use lambda or zeta or mu of log of x and variance of log of x. These two are equivalent formulation. So mu of x is the mean or the expected value of my log normal variable in its original space. Lambda is the mean or the expected value in the log transform space, okay? And we can refer as well to mu of ln of x, okay? These two formulations are equivalent. Sigma x square is the variance of x in its original space, so the log normal random variable. Here, zeta square is the variance in the log transform space. So we can go from one parameterization to the other using these two formulations. Okay, and note that if my coefficient of variation is smaller than 0 0.3, the coefficient of variation for my log normal random variable is going to be really close to my parameter zeta, so the standard deviation in the log transform space. So the key property for the log normal random variable is that it's strictly defined only for positive value. Okay, so it's going to describe my PDF for a random variable x, such that my possible outcomes are defined in the positive real domain. So we're gonna say x is distributed like a log normal, parameterized typically by a lambda and zeta. So the expected value in the log transform space, standard deviation in the log transform space. And this is the PDF for my log normal uh, random variable, okay? And this is only defined for x greater than zero. So here's an example of PDF uh, in the original space for parameter mu x equal 2, sigma x equal 1, and the corresponding lambda and zeta, so expected value and standard deviation in the log transform space looking like this, okay? Really hard to interpret in the log transform space, but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two. So this is x, and if we scale that axis to make a log of x, this is the PDF. So what does it mean? It means a log normal PDF is normal in a log transform space. Okay, here you see lambda plus and minus zeta. Here you see that mean plus and minus one standard deviation. Okay, it's symmetric in the log transform space because it's normal. It's non-symmetric in the original space. Okay, but how do we obtain this formulation for that log normal PDF? Where does it come from? Actually, we're going to reuse what we saw in module 1b when we saw the change of variable rule. So we say that we have our original space, okay, x, which is defined in our log normal space, only for positive real value. Then we're going to say we have a transformation function from that real space to that real positive space. So x prime is going to be the uh, real positive space, and the transformation between the two is going to be the log function. So x prime equals log of x. So here we assume that we know what is the PDF in the log transform space. We defined it earlier as being a multi or a log normal uh, normal distribution. So we know that f of x prime is normal with mean value lambda and variance zeta square. So here what we want to obtain is the PDF for f of x, which is going to be the analytical formulation for our log normal PDF. So in that case, using a change of variable rules, we can write that f of x prime dx prime must be equal to f of x dx. What we're looking for is this, so we can send the dx on the other side, take the absolute value, and by applying this, knowing that this is normal, we're going to obtain the analytical formulation for our log normal PDF. The only thing we need to define is what is that dx prime dy? So dx prime dy is the derivative of ln of x. We know it's 1 over x. 
So basically my PDF or my log normal distribution, it's one over X times the normal PDF evaluated for my transformation log of X parameterized by lambda and zeta squared. And if we express this normal PDF, it looks like this. One over the square root of two pi times zeta exponential of minus one half, the log of x minus lambda over zeta. Okay, here we replace uh, x by log of x because x prime by log of x because this is our function here. And this is described for x greater than zero. So this is how we obtain the formulation for the log normal PDF. So we can say that f we have a, a set of n jointly normal random variable, then the log of the same set of the log of those random variable is going to be jointly normal. Okay, the multivariate log normal PDF is going to be described by the um, expected value and standard deviation in the log transform space, so the lambdas and the zetas in the log transform space, as well as the correlation coefficient defined in the transform space, so the log space. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the correlation coefficient in the log transform space and the correlation coefficient in the original space, okay? And it's given by this formulation here. And again, for coefficient of variation smaller, uh, much smaller than 0 0.3, the correlation coefficient in the log transform space and correlation coefficient in the original space are almost equal. So if we look at the formulation, the bivariate formulation for the log normal PDF, it looks like this. So on the left of the exponential is going to be our normalization constant. This is the part is function of x1, function of x2, and this is what controls our linear dependency in the log transform space between x1 and x2. So if we want to plot that relationship, this is the joint PDF for x1, x2, the joint log normal. These are my marginal, and we see the contour, which are equivalent to that surface here. Now, what are the properties of that log normal PDF? Actually, most of the properties are simply inherited from the properties of the multivariate normal. So for instance, they are completely defined by its mean vector and covariance. Its marginal distribution are gonna be also log normal. The conditional distribution are going to be also uh, log normal. Uh, so here, this shouldn't go there. This should go at the marginal, the conditional. Uh, we are also have, like it was the case for the multivariate normal, the absence of correlation also imply statistical independence. In the general case, it's not true. It's true for the normal. It's true for the log normal. It's not true in the general case. And we know that the multiplication of joint log normal random variable is going to be jointly log normal. So if x is log normal, y is log normal, both are statistically independent. I want to know what's going to be the PDF of z. It's going to be a, a log normal distribution where the uh, lambda value is going to be the sum of lambda x plus lambda y. So the expected value in the log transform space the variance of the log transform space, the sum of the variance for x and y, again, in the log transform space. We can have the extension of the central, the central limit theorem, which says the synthetic distribution obtained from the product of iid log normal random variable is still going to be log normal. So given a set of n random variable, which are identically distributed and independent, their product is still going to be uh, log normal as n tends to infinity. Okay, the last distribution I want to see with you is the beta distribution, okay? We saw the normal, which was defined in the real space, so from minus infinity to plus infinity. The long normal is going to be for positive space, and the beta is going to be uh, defined for a range between 0 and 1, okay? We're going to see more detail about this description. We're going to look in detail about the normalization function, which is going to be the beta function. And finally, we're going to apply it to a Tomtac example. So here we say that the x is a random variable, which is distributed like a beta distribution for the possible outcome x and parameterized by alpha and beta. Okay. And here, as I mentioned, the specificity of this beta distribution is that it's defined for possible outcomes that are belonging to the range 0 to 1. 
okay? So the PDF or the analytical formulation for this PDF takes this form here, okay? It's gonna be x to the power alpha minus one times one minus x to the power beta minus one. And this is divided by the beta function, which are function of alpha and beta, my two parameter for my beta PDF, where both alpha and beta must be greater than zero. So here it's gonna be perfectly useful to use that beta PDF, because if I can say I have an event A and its complement, so an event and its complement is always a sampling space, okay? I can say that I can characterize my uncertainty about the probability of that event. I can characterize that uncertainty by representing that probability by my random variable x, which is going to be beta distributed, okay? Then the probability of the complement is going to be 1 minus that random variable. So in that case, the interpretation I can have is that these are three examples of the beta PDF. Okay, in blue, we have for alpha equal one and beta equal one. We have a uniform PDF. If alpha equal three, beta equal three, we see we concentrate our knowledge, but it's still symmetric. If alpha equal three, beta equal 0.5, we see we obtain an asymmetric PDF as obtained here. And here, the intuitive interpretation of what are the parameters alpha and beta doing, we can interpret this as a number of occurrence for the outcome A. This is going to be alpha. In a case where we see that X is the probability of the event A. The parameter beta, we can interpret this as a number of occurrence of the complement of A. Okay, this is the interpretation for alpha and beta. Now, before putting that into application, let's look at the beta function. So here, what we have is the beta PDF. So this is the beta PDF. This is the beta function. So what is that beta function, okay? If we integrate what's on the numerator here of my uh, beta PDF, actually, uh, we, can, or we can represent, we can say that our beta PDF is proportional to what we have on the numerator here. What it means is if we integrate this for all the values of x between zero and one, we're gonna get our beta function. Okay, so the beta function by definition is the integral of what we have on the numerator from zero to one, okay? So let's put that into application. Let's say that we have a sampling space because we want to characterize the probability of a time tag, okay, why? If I want to characterize the probability of a coin flip, I mean, this is not really interesting. We all know that the probability of head or tail is 0.5. Okay, but now I have a thumb tag. What is the probability of end or tail for that thumb tag? I don't know. Is it 0.6? Is it 0.4? Is it 0.3? I don't know. Okay, what I want to do is to perform some experiments. So I'm going to make some throws of my thumb tags. And from the result, I want to characterize what is the probability of end. So uh, landing end first or, or end down. Okay, and I'm going to say my knowledge of that probability of landing at down is going to be X, where X is going to be a beta PDF. So let's look at this together. Okay, so I start by, I have no tropes. Okay, I don't know, my, I assume that I have a uniform prior knowledge for what is here, the, um, the blue line, this represents uh, the probability of what's the probability of that time tag landing on ad. Okay, this is a conservative assumption. And what you see in pink is my confidence interval. So there's 95% of the probability content that is in that pink region. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do explicit throws of that time tag. And as we saw before, the parameters alpha and beta that parameterize my beta PDF can be uh, interpreted as the number of outcome of head and beta, the number of outcome of tail, okay? I'm gonna do a first row and we're gonna update our knowledge as I, I'm doing some throw. So first row, I'm obtaining an add, okay? Then I increment by one my parameter alpha by keeping to zero my parameter beta, okay? I take a second one, it's still add. It changed my knowledge. Add for a third time. 
and for a fourth time. Okay, so and seems to be more likely than tail. Okay, and this is reflected by my beta PDF here. And what you see on the rightmost graph is as a function of the number of observations I've done so far, what is x? The probability of adding on the add down, okay? What do you see in red is the expected value. What do you see in pink is the same confidence interval you see here, okay? And we see we start with a really diffuse prior knowledge. And as we do more tests, now it's a tail, okay? It modified my knowledge. I have add, 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 add. And so it, it seems to be a lot tail, a lot more likely to be add than tail. But so far, I don't have a precise knowledge. And this beta PDF describes my current amount of knowledge for what could be the real probability of add and tail. But since I have done only 11 trials, I don't have a perfect certainty. Okay? Let's assume that instead of having done only 11 trials, I would have done tons of them. Like, I don't know what's going to be the outcome. I just add many trials. You see that as I increase the number of outcome I'm going to do, the more and more I'm going to concentrate my knowledge toward a specific value. Okay? If instead of here, we are going to directly say I'm going to have 100 uh, head and I'm going to have 20 tails, so you see, it's gonna really shrink. If I assume that I have 100 heads and 20 tails, you see how sharp is my knowledge. If I have 1,000 versus 200, I'm gonna have the same expected value, but a much more concentrated knowledge. 10,000 and 2,000, I'm gonna have a really high confidence about what's the exact probability of landing head down, okay? This is a trivial example of what we can do. But we're going to see in much more detail how can we deconstruct that example in module three and why is that? What is the explanation behind, behind why I can model my parameter alpha and beta for my beta distribution as the number of observation, okay? The reason is because it's a conjugate prior. We're going to see that in detail in module three, okay? And we're going to reuse that later on when we're going to build our machine learning model. So as a summary from what we've seen here, the first distribution we saw is the normal uh, distribution. The univariate normal is going to say is going to be represented like this. X is distributed like a univariate normal, which describes the probability density function for the possible outcome X as parameterized by the expected value and variance. Okay, where X is defined in the real space. So we can say that if X and Y are uh, two normal random variables that are statistically independent. Z, which is represented by the sum of these variables, is also normal, okay? And this generally apply for any linear function of random variable. If we have the multivariate normal, it's going to be defined by its mean vector and covariance matrix. Uh, the pro key property that we're going to use in the context of machine learning is that the conditional distribution of multivariate normal are still normal, okay? And we have analytically tractable formulation for their conditional mean vector and covariance matrix. In the case of the log normal, if we can say that X is distributed like the uh, log normal univariate PDF or univariate log normal uh, distribution, defined for the outcome X and is parameterized by the expected value defined in the log transform space as well as standard deviation in the log transform space. And here, this log normal variable is only defined for X between zero and plus infinity. So if X is log normal and Y is log normal, then we can say that Z, uh, which is made of the product of X times Y, is going to be also log normal. And finally, the last distribution we saw is beta, which is defined for uh, x defined in the range 0 to 1. So normal in the real space, log normal in the positive space, and beta for a specific range between 0 and 1. So that's all what I, what I wanted to see. In the next chapter, we're going to build on these PDF we covered together here today.